Good evening. Good evening. Good evening and welcome uh, to our debate tonight. Resolved, the Chinese system is better than the American or European system at providing stability, prosperity, and freedom. My name is Tom Sarouf, and I'm an Associate Programs Officer at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and we're proud to put on tonight's debate. Um, I'd like to thank you all in the audience, both uh, in person and online via our live stream for joining us tonight and watching and engaging in uh, this discussion and uh, this exchange of ideas and perspectives. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Uh, this is brought to you by the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation. Uh, and so we thank them for their generosity for making all of this possible. And also with our co-sponsors with the Abigail Adams Institute. As I understand it, uh, we've been doing this with them for a number of years now, a few years, and it's great to be working with you again. Um, before I introduce tonight's speakers and our moderator, I just want to give one brief uh, announcement uh, about a future debate that ISI is putting on, and that is uh, a debate on transgenderism and womanhood between Michael Knowles and uh, Dr. Deirdre McCloskey, and that's going to be at the University of Pittsburgh on April 18th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, and you can sign up for the live stream to watch that debate at isi.org slash events. Uh, and without further ado, I will uh, introduce tonight's speakers and our moderator, who will then explain the, the structure of the debate and get things rolling for us. Arguing in favor of the resolution tonight is uh, Arnaud Bertrand, who is a French entrepreneur who founded House Trip, which was sold to TripAdvisor, and Me and Chi. He lives in China and is a frequent commentator on the country. Arnaud graduated from EHL in Lausanne, Switzerland, and has been made an honorary professor at the school. And arguing against the resolution is Dr. Adrian Zenz, who is a senior fellow and director in China studies at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation in Washington, DC. His research is on China's ethnic policy, Beijing's campaign of mass internment, securitization and forced labor in Xinjiang, public recruitment and coercive poverty of alleviation in Tibet and Xinjiang, and China's domestic security budgets. Dr. Zenz is the author of uh, Tibetanese Under Threat and co-editor of Mapping Amdo, Dynamics of Change. And our moderator tonight is Dr. Danila Petronovic, who is the director of the Abigail Adams Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Previously, Dr. Petronovic has taught political science at Duke University and Yale University, and he earned his bachelor's degree in 2000 here at Harvard, where he concentrated in social studies. And with that, I'll kick it over to you, uh, Danilo, and I hope everyone enjoys tonight's debate. Thank you, Thomas, very much, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening, and thank you, those watching the live stream as well. And again, uh, I want to express my gratitude to ISI and to Collegiate Studies Institute and to the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation. If you don't know the name, uh, Davis uh, has a connection with Harvard. That's the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Some of you have probably taken classes there as well. So, okay, uh, briefly, Abigail Adams um, is an independent scholarly enterprise interested in reviving liberal arts education within the Harvard intellectual community. We foster the spirit of intellectual adventure and seek to model integrative core learning, which we usually do by reading and discussing important books. Okay. The great ideas debate this evening is framed, framed in following terms, as Thomas said. Resolved, the Chinese system is better than the American or European at providing stability, prosperity, and freedom. The Chinese economy grew by nearly 1,000% from 1970 to 2010, and the average household income in China has risen by 400% in the last 10 years. Even though the Chinese population is substantially larger, it has significantly fewer people living below the poverty line, 13.5 versus 39.7 million. These are most recent stats from ISI that we got this morning on, uh, um, as a reminder of the debate. China has the word, world's largest retailer, Alibaba. And China has the second largest number of billionaires behind the US. On the material prosperity metric, there's little question that China has been, has been spectacularly successful. But there's, of course, more to good government than just, than just that. So what else is there? 
In our resolution, we referred to three broad categories, stability, prosperity, and freedom. And it is my hope that our debaters will address at minimum these three important components of a good society. And I certainly uh, um, invite them to address more. It is my hope that this discussion will stimulate, above all, the young people in our intellectual community to go beyond the noisy, media-driven sloganeering we're all exposed to, especially of late. The hope is to motivate a better understanding of the fascinating histories and natures of these two systems of governance, or in less technocratic terms, political regimes that guide and govern the people of the United States and China, respectively. Okay. The format of the debate is as follows. The first speaker, Arno, will speak between 15 and 20 minutes. And after the second speaker does the same, the first speaker will take no more than 10 minutes to respond. And he can use this time to pose a direct question to the other speaker. The second speaker then does the same. And then we go into the second stage of the debate, where I will pose select audience questions to the debaters and those who are here. Uh, but not our online viewers, will have a chance to participate by asking questions. You have those three by five or four by six, I don't know which one, cards uh, that you can pick up. Please write legibly and be succinct, and I will then do my best to um, ask the best questions uh, that come to my uh, attention. So thank you very much, and Arno, uh, please uh, come on up. So, uh, first of all, let me thank the uh, Intercollegiate Studies Institute and the Abigail Adams Institute for organizing this event and for inviting me. Before I go into the meat of the debate, let me make a disclaimer. One unstated idea uh, that derives from the resolution, which states that the Chinese model is better than the American or the European one, is that both models compete against each other and that both models are universal with the idea that if the Chinese model uh, is indeed better, it can take over the world. I don't believe this to be true at all. I think the Chinese model applies uniquely and only to China, that it is the product of China's very long and unique history, and that it also fits the very particular context that China is in today. Economic context, geopolitical context, but doesn't fit or pretend to fit other countries. You don't need to take my word for it. Most serious observers agree on this. Uh, for instance, Paul Heer, the former national intelligence officer for East Asia, which is the highest position in the US intelligence community for observing China. Here is what he writes. Uh, China is trying to pursue multi-priority and international legitimacy for their system, not impose it on other countries. Another one is Harvard's uh, Stephen Walt, a legendary professor of international relations here. He writes, China explicitly embraces the idea that each country should determine for itself how it is governed. The US, by contrast, loves to lecture others on how they should govern themselves and keeps trying to get other countries to embrace our liberal values. Or again, Kissinger writes in his famous book on China, China never espoused the American notion of universalism to spread its values around the world. So to conclude on this disclaimer, the debate here is very much on which system is better for their own people, not which system will be universally better for um, everyone, since the Chinese system doesn't pretend to be universal. With that being said, let's go into the meat of the debate. First of all, there is little doubt that the Western system has done a fantastic job at spreading, at providing freedom, prosperity, and stability for its people over many decades. But there is also little doubt that it's increasingly losing its way. As counterintuitive as it might sound, I will show that the Chinese system has now become better in many ways at providing stability, prosperity, and even freedom for its people. Let me start with freedom. I will explain that we've progressively come to have a rather skewed understanding of freedom uh, in the West, where we equate freedom with individual freedom, when it's actually very much not the same thing. I will show that when you have a broader understanding of freedom, like we actually used to have in the past, it becomes quite obvious that China might not in fact be the unfree place most people in the West picture it as, 
and vice versa, the West might not be quite so free. Let me take a concrete example. China's war on poverty, unarguably an immense success. Danilo just gave you some metrics. The largest and fastest reduction of poverty uh, the world has ever seen. Even China's biggest detractors agree to this. But guess what? It came at the cost of um, quite a bit of individual freedom. You probably remember the headlines in Western media when the Chinese government was destroying all buildings in Chinese cities and uprooting people. But look at the result. Extreme poverty has, by and large, uh, been eradicated in China. And it's real. I've traveled all over China uh, during seven years. The, the results are obvious. Can anyone genuinely make the case this made people less free? that they were freer when they were poor? Of course not. Poverty is the antithesis of freedom. When you live in poverty, you're quite literally a slave to your condition. In contrast, there is a lot of poverty in countries like France and the US. You go to certain areas of Paris and you see hundreds of tens of homeless people. Any one of you can go to China today, travel all around the country, and it's extremely unlikely you will see even a single homeless person. Personally, in all my years traveling around China, uh, I can count on the fingers of one hand the times I've seen homeless people. I think the official number for the US, for, from the US Census Bureau, is 6% of the population living in what, it, in, in what it calls deep poverty. A recent study from the Urban Institute also revealed that in 2022, 25% of uh, US adults experience food insecurity, meaning they sometimes can't afford to eat. In France, we had 14% of the population living under the poverty threshold. Can we genuinely say that those people are really free? Many have forgotten this, but FDR, Roosevelt, in 1941, gave a so-called Four Freedoms speech, where he defined freedom from want and freedom from fear as two of the four freedoms uh, America ought to achieve. So he too recognized that poverty elevation was fundamental to freedom. And since we're speaking about freedom from fear, that's another good one. Let's ask ourselves a simple question. Do people feel free to work uh, alone anywhere in America at any time of the day or night? Do people have this freedom? Well, this freedom by and large does exist in China. The statistics are absolutely incredible you're 70 times more likely to be a victim of a violent crime in the US than you are in China. This is anecdotal, but in my seven years in China, not only have I never been a witness or, God forbid, victim of any crime, but I've never had anyone of my, in my acquaintances who was. It's a very, very safe country. Uh, so this freedom from fear does exist. I could go on and on about various form, forms of freedom, freedom from drugs, for instance. Overdoses are the leading cause of death for U.S. adults aged 18 to 45, while China has one of the lowest drug abuse rates in the world. What could be a bigger restriction on freedom than an addiction to drugs? Freedom via education is another example. In this place, right next to Harvard, I don't need to tell you that knowledge and education is a form of freedom. It broadens your perspective and leads to increased opportunities. Take any international education benchmark today, like the OECD's PISA rankings, for instance, and China tops the charts, with the West far behind. Or I could speak about freedom, period. America has 25% of the world's prisoners, when it only has 3% of the world's population. That's an incarceration rate six to seven times higher than China's. Actual physical freedom matters when we're discussing freedom, right? But I will conclude with probably the biggest form of freedom, a freedom that the General de Gaulle, who was our last great president in France, used to describe as the precondition for all other freedoms, and that is your independence as a country, your collective freedom to determine your own future. Can anyone argue that when you're a so-called vassal state or when you're in a larger state's so-called sphere of influence, you're really free? Anyone can see that's not quite true. America, of course, isn't anyone's vassal state, uh, quite the contrary, in fact. But there is something that limits America's freedom in that regard, its system of alliances. America is in many, many alliances, NATO, AUKUS, the Five Eyes, with Japan, with Taiwan, and so on and so forth. And, of course, 
these two limit your, your freedom of action, since on paper, at least, you're committed to certain actions, even though they might not be in your interest at that point in time. As we've painfully learned from World War I, uh, alliances can be incredibly constraining and destructive. China is unarguably the freest country in the world in that regard, as it cannot be even remotely considered as being anyone's vassal state, and it just doesn't do military alliances. It doesn't have any. In fact, many argue that it's precisely this independence that's driving the current attempt to contain China. So this high level of sovereignty allows China to focus on internal development and to maintain its freedom of action on the international stage. Okay, I spent a lot of time on freedom. Let's speak about stability and prosperity. Stability is the easy one. China is quite literally the oldest continuous civilization in the history of mankind. If that's not stability, uh, I'm not sure what is. And if we look at how things are right now, no one can argue that China isn't a stable society. Most surveys done on the Chinese population, even by Western institutions, show that the Chinese population is extra extraordinarily united on the line on how they view their system. For instance, the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Harvard Kennedy School did a 13-year-long study interrogating the Chinese population, which they summarized in a 2020 report entitled Understanding CCP Resilience. Their conclusion is, I quote, there is little evidence to support the idea that the CCP is losing legitimacy in the eyes of its people. In fact, they find out that 93% of the Chinese people are satisfied with the Chinese central government. Um, why wouldn't they be? Uh, China has just experienced the fastest improvements in living conditions of any country in history. The US and Europe is, of course, a vastly different story. Satisfaction rates with public institutions are, as we all know, at all times low, almost anywhere in the West. For instance, in the US, public trust in government went from more than 70% in the 1960s to a mere 20% today. In France, only 28% of citizens trust their public institutions. When you ask Americans, an extraordinary 43% believe civil war is likely within the next 10 years. And if we take a step back and look at the, the long term, let's run a third experiment. Imagine you get frozen and woken up in 300 years. You can be almost 100% sure that China will be highly rec recognizable. It will have the same language, the same traditions, the same basic cultural features, like the importance of family, the importance of education, meritocracy, the paternalistic style of government, a largely secular society, and so on and so forth. Why can you be so sure? Because when you study the matter, despite the rise and fall of dynasties in China, the broad characteristics of Chinese society are extraordinarily stable over time. I was fascinated to read about Matteo Ricci, a 16th century Jesuit priest who was really the first Westerner since Marco Polo uh, who managed to get at the heart of the Chinese system. It's stunning to see how similar things were back then. For instance, he went to China, of course, to spread Christianity at the time. And to do so, he first disguised himself as a Buddhist monk because he assumed that by claiming that Christianism was a branch of Buddhism, it would be easier to make it understood by the Chinese. But after a while, he noticed that no matter the religion, there is a lot of wariness towards religion in Chinese elites, and there is an unbreachable separation between religion and politics. So after 10 years of failing to make much inroads, he finally decided to dress up as a Confucian scholar uh, to present himself as a philosopher uh, instead of a monk, as someone who had understood the Chinese classics instead of a religious man. And understand the Chinese classics, he did. Uh, in fact, we owe him the first ever Latin translations of Chinese classics. And it's only after this transformation that he managed to get closer to Chinese elites and to make inroads for his ideas. Today, we blame China's secularism on communism. But Rich's experience shows that this couldn't be further from the truth. It's always been there. We also lament that China didn't adopt Western liberal democracy 
from us. But again, Richie's experience shows that ideas coming from abroad require a considerable degree of cynicization before they're even considered in China. Same with communism, by the way. The official term for it in China is socialism with Chinese characteristics. The key term is, of course, Chinese characteristics. Um, those characteristics are actually very dominant. Back to my thought experiment, what you can also be 100% sure about is that 300 years from now, America and the whole Western world will be almost unrecognizable. I mean, the US didn't even exist as a country 300 years ago. As for France, in 1723, we were a monarchy under Louis XV, a country with totally different values. Much of our life revolved around religion when one of our core values is secularity today. And in fact, ironically, when you study the movement of the Lumière, the Enlightenment with Voltaire and Rousseau, which led to France's transformation into a secular society, it's clear that many of these ideas were influenced by Chinese philosophy, by the very translation of the Chinese classics uh, made by Matteo Ricci. So ironically, even though Ricci went to China to spread Christianity, it's us who ended up probably more transformed by Chinese ideas than they were by ours. Anyhow, to conclude on stability, it's clear that both right now, but also from a long-term historical perspective, the Chinese system is very enduring, whereas the Western system is more unstable and more subject to deep transformations, which can be good, of course, but is also very destabilizing. Let's finish with prosperity. And again, what's prosperity? If we talk GDP per capita or salary levels, then obviously the average Chinese citizen is still less prosperous than its Western counterparts. They also obviously started their modern economic development from a much lower base uh, and much more recently, so the comparison isn't quite fair. The right way of looking at it, I believe, is to therefore look at the approach China is taking to make its citizens prosperous versus the approach the West is taking on which one is more likely to achieve sustainable prosperity over the long run. We already talked about poverty alleviation and the efforts made by China in that regard. In fact, between 2014 and 2021, eight years, if one adds up all the types of funding directly dedicated to lifting people out of poverty, China spends close to 14 trillion yuan on this effort, or about 2.1 trillion dollars. Here is a telling parallel. This is roughly what the US Department of Defense and the State Department jointly spent on their post-911 wars in the Middle East and Afghanistan, which is quite illustrative of the different priorities of the two nations on how they impact prosperity. And that's the main point I'm going to make when it comes to prosperity. It's what China spends almost all its money on, investing in itself, in its people, doing projects of a scale that boggles the mind to make the Chinese people more prosperous. And I think everyone can agree that's not quite what's being done in the West. Another one that everyone knows about is infrastructure. Since 2008, China has built 25,000 miles of high-speed rail and plans to build another 7,000 by 2025. The US famously has only 50 miles of high-speed rail in the country. Or energy infrastructure. China is, of course, famous for its humongous energy projects like the Three Gorges Dam. China will also open more nuclear reactors in the next 15 years than the rest of the world combined uh, in the past 35. Or um, yesterday, China Daily, the newspaper, announced that China will meet its solar and wind goals for 2030, five years early, and that China's national capacity for renewable energy had overtaken coal for the first time. This matters because most research indicates that energy is the most important input for prosperity. China already consumes 50% more energy than the US. And if you look at the trend, China consumes more and more and more energy, and the US has been roughly flat since the year 2000. Europe, as is fairly easy to predict with its current predicament, will also find it very difficult, if not impossible, to significantly increase its energy consumption in the foreseeable future. Over time, such investments dramatically increase efficiency, productivity, and of course, actual outputs, all of which contribute to prosperity. It just makes sense. The more you invest in yourself, 
the better your chances at making it. China being the country most relentless, focused on dedicated in investing in itself, it's almost guaranteed that they will deliver more prosperity to their people in the foreseeable future. So as an overall conclusion, I hope I've shown you that the Chinese system with its emphasis on collective freedom, long-term stability, and unwavering investment in itself has demonstrated its ability to provide a more holistic approach to societal well-being. While the American and the European systems have their merits, it is the Chinese system unique blend of these attributes that ensures its citizens can enjoy greater overall stability, prosperity, and even freedom. Thank you. Thank you. I hope not both of my microphones are on, otherwise we're in trouble. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me here tonight. It's a pleasure and I apologize in advance for my voice. I hope it's going to last. Um, I would like to first commend the previous speaker, Mr. Bertrand, for adopting the attitude of a learner, seeking to learn from another culture and society is a needful and humble task, and it's one we should take seriously. However, in today's debate, <clears throat> I would like to advance the following argument. And it's a particular argument, and I'm sure as there's ongoing discussion, I can get more into all of the aspects of the general debate resolution. The argument is basically, while China as a country has, has achieved remarkable progress, I will today argue that this achievement has been substantially brought about not so much by the Chinese governance model, namely the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, but by the hard-working, creative, and entrepreneurial Chinese people from which we have much to learn. And I think conceptually, I think it's actually quite important to separate um, characteristics of the population or culture from the government's model, since we're looking at, at um, model or governance, in my opinion, not so much cultural features. In my initial remarks, I will for now take it granted although I will get to it to some extent, that the CCP governance provides significantly less individual freedoms than liberal democracy. Therefore, um, when, for example, it lacks a, fr a free press, free civil society, and the separation of powers, key, basic key pillars of the uh, um, division of powers that guarantee uh, freedoms and liberties in our liberal democracies. I will, however, focus more on China's so-called economic miracle and the CCP model of governance. After disastrous errors during Mao Zedong's rule, the CCP has by and large provided a system of stable governance that created the conditions for economic growth. This stability is also a primary pillar of legitimacy used by the CCP to justify its absolute rule. However, the stability comes at a major cost. Stability, also it's important to note, is not a monopoly of authoritarian governments. After learning periods, other countries in Asia and elsewhere have successfully adopted Western-style liberal democracy and experienced stable growth conditions, promoting economic growth based on their own unique cultural conditions and other conditions. Promoting economic growth but with much greater individual freedom and less cost to human lives. Examples include South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, or India. There's plenty of scope for us here to rethink our excessive focus on materialism and individualism. However, these ills are also arguably a major and growing problem in Chinese society as material prosperity and capitalism and other aspects there have increased. The first point I'd like to make is the factors behind the success of China's growth model. How did China lift hundreds of millions out of poverty? The CCP touts this as a miracle, and in many ways it is a miracle. However, the answer is also quite simple. As the economist correspondent in China, David Rennie, has rightly observed, Chinese people, by working extremely hard, lifted themselves out of poverty in part because some of the worst economic policies ever created 
by Chairman Mao were abandoned in favor of versions of capitalism. What Rennie refers to as the worst economic policies ever was in fact a standard approach of communist economic strategy. Mao Zedong simply adopted Stalin's Soviet industrialization model, whereby urban industrial growth was achieved by exploiting the peasants. Through collectivization and controlled population mobility, peasants could not seek urban employment. This forced rural population shares in China to remain stable between 1955 and 1978 at around 85%, creating a huge artificial pool of impoverished surplus laborers. Deng Xiaoping's reforms from the 80s unleashed millions of these surplus workers who became a major driver of China's hypercapitalist, export-driven development strategy. As a result, by the mid-2000s, China's socioeconomic inequality had increased significantly. Its Gini coefficient, a measure of uh, inequality, rose to nearly 50, one of the highest figures in the world. It's come slightly down since. The state needed labor exploitation for its growth model and actively suppressed labor rights. In 2018, the authorities arrested members of a Marxist student group advocating for workers' rights in line with Marxist thought, and there are many other examples of the suppression of labor rights. In his book, The Myth of Chinese Capitalism, Dexter Roberts argues that the approximately 288 million wage laborers locked into low wages with few social benefits have been an integral part of what he terms an apartheid system undergirding China's 30-year economic miracle. Robert states that the government ensured a reliable supply of low-wage, permanently powerless workers, enabling China to undersell global manufacturers. And these, uh, these migrants couldn't get social services in the city or benefits in the cities where they worked because of the, the hukou or um, household registration model, uh, relegating them to second class. Very complicated topic. Some of that has been improved since. I, it is very deep. Second, the limits of China's e growth model. In a normal economy, GDP growth is measure, measured at the end of each year. In China, the government determines GDP targets at the beginning of each year, then achieves them not just through genuine growth based on productive economic activity, but through inflated growth, debt finance infrastructure, and inflated property market. Scholars have pointed out that China's GDP growth is not really a measure of actual economic performance at the moment. It used to be. Until the late 2000s, this worked well. In an underinvested developing economy like China in the 80s and 90s, investment in property and infrastructure creates growth conditions. However, from the mid 2000s, the return on investment in infrastructure declined, resulting in systemic waste and rising debt. To ensure continued rule, the state has simply continued this model. By 2022, China's total debt to GDP ratio exceeded that of the United States by over 40%. Realizing mounting structural problems and the unsustainability of this approach, the state is now attempting to shift gear. But it is very politically difficult for Beijing to adjust because China's growth through debt model benefits the established kleptocratic elites. Economic growth occurs through either investment, trade surplus or consumption. The CCP relies on investment and trade and it has neglected consumption. Chinese household consumption makes up only 40% of GDP, far below the 60% average for other nations. Households only retain and consume a small share of what they produce. When I lived in China in the 2000s, people would often be impressed by the growth they saw around them. Tall buildings, new infrastructure, their own lives also improved, but not nearly as much as the growth they saw around them. And, and that was actually quite right, that observation. Likewise, we are often impressed by China's outwardly visible growth, but improvements in people's livelihoods, especially for most rural Chinese, while present, most certainly, are not as impressive. In 2020, approximately 500 million, or 70% of the labor force, mostly rural, did not have a high school education, making China the least educated middle-income economy in the world. It's actually a fact that's being debased in, uh, debated in uh, academic papers at the moment. All these years, Chinese households have subsidized China's enormous trade surpluses through low wages. During the pandemic, many Western countries extended transfer payments to households, as here in the United States. 
while Beijing, however, again supported companies, supply-side support. In 2023, several Chinese cities continued to pursue infrastructure projects while scaling back basic services such as public transport. The only way to fix China's growth model is to shift from investment to consumption, but someone has to absorb the cost, either businesses or the public sector, mainly local governments. This runs counter to decades-long entrenched political interest. Local governments mainly rely on land sales and for decades engaged in land grabbing from peasants, paying them a pittance and selling it at a premium to investors. This system crucially relied on ever-increasing property prices. Deflating the property bubble, therefore, directly hits local governments, and this is what happened in 2021. Professor Michael Pettis at Peking University School of Management argues that China's property market is as inflated as Japan's two decades ago, meaning that China is faced with the prospect of Japanification, namely a long-term period of low economic growth. So basically, the, the, the Chinese growth model is running out of steam and it's in a quite a precarious situation at the moment. To sum, sum this up, China's economic growth miracle resulted from releasing a peasantry trapped in an unequal Stalinist rural urban transfer model into a system of export-driven labor exploitation coupled with trickle-down effects. The CCP provided a measure of stable governance and facilitated an impressive reversal of Mao's failed policies. This was aided by the systematic state-sponsored theft of foreign intellectual property. However, since the late 2000s, the approach has relied on inflated, unsustainable supply-side-driven growth. Third, the coercive edge of China's growth model. When Xi Jinping assumed power in 2012, he made the eradication of absolute power, not relative po uh, of absolute poverty, sorry, by 2020 his signature goal. Beijing claims to have achieved this goal, which might be possible. Its poverty standard is $1.60 per day below the World Bank's line to measure extreme global poverty of $1.90 per day. By around 2016, when the 2020 goal came nearer, Beijing declared a war on poverty. To understand what that means, we need a short excursion on mobilizational campaigns, and that's a major explanatory factor in CCP governance, okay? The CCP's bureaucracy is built on a Leninist model of party organization, which heavily relies on mobilizational campaigns to achieve policy implementation. A key feature of the communist state is an extensive grassroots apparatus that pressures the population into desired political action. Such mobilizational capacity is also the precondition for state-sponsored forced labor, which is primarily found in communist or post-communist countries, at the moment in particular in Xinjiang. Xi Jinping's campaign to eradicate absolute poverty is a classic example of the coercive pressures inherent in such mobilizational campaigns. Even Chinese academic research itself shows that, especially among ethnic minorities, not all want the government-directed poverty alleviation, of course they want better lives, which often comes with the simulatory pressures and changes in livelihoods that can tear apart traditional communities. In June 2017, Xi Jinping stated that deeply impoverished areas suffer from a low level of social civilization and inner motivation. In the November of that year, the state called for poverty elevation to stimulate people's motivation by establishing a poverty elevation military order, using pressure to change livelihood modes and to achieve the 2020 target at all cost. Xi Jinping's targeted poverty elevation pursues not just material poverty elevation, but also a so-called spiritual poverty elevation. Jingshun Tuopin, defined as a lack of inner motivation, backward thinking, and outdated social customs that need to be changed. To outsiders, including us Westerners, campaign-style mobilization looks very impressive, but it comes with several major disadvantages. First, it significantly increases the risk of coercive pressure. Second, mobilizational campaigns go all out on one issue, but then tend to neglect it when the next campaign comes along. One example is the latest drive to promote China's food security. Some regions were planting modern exotic produce with higher profit margins and employed poor villagers to get them out of poverty. Recently, however, with the drive for food security, they were coaxed now to revert back to planting rice as part of the new push to have more basic staples. They had to, at least in some cases, had to send villagers back into unemployment. It's just an example of how one campaign supersedes another. 
Another example is zero COVID, which was implemented at all cost, including unnecessary cost of lives. One could say much about that. Until its sudden and total abandonment without regard to vulnerable elderly populations. China's ability to rapidly mobilize society to contain COVID early in the pandemic is not so much due to cultural collectivism or selfless prioritizing of the greater good or to Confucian values, although this, these all play a role. Rather, it is a central feature of how the Leninist party state works, who performs such mobilization, not so much because, necessarily because it cares about citizens, but it, uh, primarily because it cares about its political self-preservation. Good. In the process, the CCP can enforce policies that save lives and promote the collective good. However, other nations with liberal democracies, such as Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, or Germany, also implemented strong COVID containment measures that temporarily infringed on individual rights, but without suppressing vigorous public debate and basic freedoms in the process. The Leninist party state can implement top-level directives at great speed, but I would argue promotes an overall system where the value of human life is ultimately discounted. Fourth, looking at CCP governance and the role of paranoia. We are all aware of the high-tech digital surveillance and increasingly sophisticated censorship in today's China. Supporters say this leads to low crime rates, but it comes at the expense of a number of basic freedoms, in particular the freedom of speech. In early 2020, we learned that the suppression of speech in China can have a significant global impact when a whistleblower, Dr. Wu Wenliang, was reprimanded for attempting to alert others to the spread of a new virus. Why was COVID hushed up in Wuhan? Because of the way the system works. The repression of speech is primarily carried out by local officials who also have most to lose if embarrassing truths come out. The suppression of domestic debate and transparency means that problems tend to be externalized rather than acknowledged. Between the 1980s and the 2000s, the CCP had a lot of internal feedback mechanisms through different factions and groupings, enabling a limited degree of criticism. In the early 2000s, Columbia professor Andrew Nathan argued that China was developing a form of authoritarian resilience through meritocracy, norm-bound succession, and participatory mechanisms. However, Xi Jinping eliminated these mechanisms, making policy failure more likely. Professor Greitens has argued that authoritarian one-man systems lead to systematically suppressed feedback, resulting in poor leadership decisions. The lack of dissent makes authoritarian regimes appear more cohesive compared to January 6th, when a right-wing mob stormed DC. However, for me, January 6th is a symbol of the strength and resilience of liberal democracies. As the majority of politicians and citizens believed in the system, it has been upheld. Behind the veneer of strongman rule, the CCP's system of governance fails to tolerate dissent, rendering it internally far more vulnerable than most liberal democracies. How much time do I have left? All right. Then I will skip ahead to my concluding thoughts. Having been part of the Western-led liberal order, China now seeks to replace or at least undermine this order in order to establish a world order that is more friendly towards authoritarianism. Xi's friendship with Putin is but the latest reflection of these efforts. What are we to make of this? Michael Schumann, senior fellow of the Atlantic Council, has aptly noted that China's economic and technological successes are in fact the world's best advertisement for the Western global order. To quote, China's economy would never have developed as quickly as it did without Western cooperation, capital, technology, and consumer markets. That's why Deng Xiaoping normalized relations with the US at the very beginning of his reform program. The US-led global order promoted the international trade and investment that helped fuel Chinese Industrialization. The US security system in East Asia offered the stability that allowed China to focus on economic development. The primary drivers of Chinese growth were based on Western concepts of private enterprise, investment, and free trade. China is indeed a model of development, but one that shows the benefits of, quote, Westernization. Thank you.
Thank you, Adrian. Just a reminder, there are, if you have a question, uh, please fill out um, or write it out here and then um, the young folks will bring it up to me in, in, a, in a few minutes. Okay, next uh, 10 minutes for um, Arno. So, um, one key argument that um, Adrian made was that China's success was more due to its people than its government. Um, and an excellent counterexample is India, because here you have a country, also in Asia, same number of people as China. Actually, India has more, more people than China now. And people who are just as smart, just as hardworking, just as capable of success as, as the Chinese. The only difference is a different form of government. And um, they started at the same low base. Uh, I think even China um, in the 1950s was uh, even much lower than India. And of course, uh, China overtook India um, as we all know. Um, and now I think Chinese economy is, uh, I don't know, something like five or six times India's. But the main argument that uh, Adrian made was on individual freedom and human rights. So let me address that. First of all, let's be clear uh, that no system is immune to human, human rights abusers. Let's not forget that we just came out of 20 years of extremely destructive wars in the Middle East and Afghanistan. According to Brown University's Cost of War project, almost a million people were killed due to direct war violence including close to 400,000 civilians. I will show you that often our accusations towards China on human rights are actually more a reflection of the deterioration of our own system, a sign of our growing inability to look inwards and focus on improving ourselves rather than a reflection of the inadequacy of the Chinese system. And that is, uh, these accusations actually have bad consequences for us and end up undermining our own prosperity, stability, and freedom. To start with, let me take you back to a moment of Cold War history that is pretty relevant, I think. In the 1960s, there were serious allegations against China that they were committing genocide against the Tibetan people. In fact, a very prestigious organization, the International Commission of Jurists, an NGO made of eminent jurists, released a detailed report that concluded, I quote, the committee found that acts of genocide had been committed in Tibet in an attempt to destroy the Tibetans as a religious group and that such acts are acts of genocide. In the report, they notably notes that there was widespread belief a large number of Tibetan women had been sterilized, an allegation that became routinely accepted as true in public discourse afterwards. It's only 34 years after that Howard Tolle, uh, American professor at the University of Cincinnati, revealed in a 1994 book that the ICJ was in fact created as a vehicle for clandestine CIA funding to provide an international propaganda counterweight to what was perceived as a potential Soviet advantage. And of course, no matter what you believe on the Tibetans' conditions in China, we know today for certain that there was no Tibetan genocide. The Tibetan population in China grew from some 2.5 million people when the allegation was made in the 1960 to 6.3 million uh, today in the latest 2020 census, meaning the population was multiplied by almost three times since the claims of genocide were made. Um, Now, of course, it's true. China has imposed real limits on Tibetans' individual freedom. They cannot worship the 14th Dalai Lama, for instance, famously. But as often when it comes to China, we distorted the truth, which is very nuanced and incredibly complex, into claims that are so extreme that they become pure phantasm. And most importantly, what good does it do? I'm deeply convinced that very few things are destructive all around, as the lectures and the claims we make on China when it comes to human rights. For instance, I firmly believe that very few things these past 30 years have done as much da damage in the Chinese people's perception of the West as the claims on Xinjiang. Why? First of all, don't assume Chinese people, especially the younger generation, aren't informed about it. All of them know about it. 
and they're actually very resentful towards us, the West, for it. The reason why is simple. Xinjiang has become one of the most popular tourist destinations in China. Tens of millions of Chinese go there every year. And why do they go there? First of all, because it's genuinely a very beautiful place, truly, uh, but also to experience Uyghur culture. Xinjiang is the most exotic place, culturally speaking, that they have in China. And what's their conclusion when they go there and they see the Uyghurs and their culture? Their conclusion can only be what the foreigners are claiming is not true. I've discussed with this matter with many Chinese and, and Uyghurs in China. They all know that many Uyghurs were sent to what the Chinese call vocational education and training centers and what we call re-education camps. And they also know that there is a lot of surveillance in Xinjiang, much more so than in the rest of China, with police stations every 100 meters, and a lot of checkpoints, and so on and so forth. Everyone can see this when they visit Xinjiang. And many Chinese, and of course Uyghurs, do agree that the response by the government to the terrorism and separatist problems in the region was very heavy-handed. And many could agree that it was too much. So if instead of using this to hit China with and create an incredibly maximalist narrative, if we'd had a message coming out of a place of genuine concern, this message might have been heard. But we didn't do that. We accused them of genocide. Not only this, but we then used this accusation to sanction China and the Uyghurs too. The US now has legislation that completely bans all exports from Xinjiang. How does cutting off the Uyghurs from international trade help them? That's a mystery to me. So all these results in turning the Chinese population against us and in actually undermining human rights because they learn to see it as a weapon, a tool in our arsenal to stir up hatred against China across the West and to justify acts of aggressions against China, like the, the sanctions. It also results in not only turning the Chinese against the West, but the entire Muslim world too. Did you notice that not a single Muslim country has backed the West on Xinjiang and have instead chosen to support China? Why? Because they've seen that movie before, the demonization, the maximalist claims, and it was directed at them and used to justify destroying their countries under the guise of trying to protect the population. These countries are not naive. Pretty much every Muslim nation has had delegations going to Xinjiang to see what was happening. And they're not afraid to voice concern when they have them. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, the second largest intergovernmental organization in the world after the UN, with 57 Muslim states as members, has, for instance, been very vocal about the treatment of Muslims in India which, just like China, is a global South country, which will be a huge, huge source of economic growth for them in the future. The fact they're vocal against India demonstrates that they don't refrain from voicing criticism in order to protect future economic prospects, as, if, as is often claimed. And what does this organization, the OIC, say about China? Let me quote one of their recent resolutions. We commend the efforts of the People's Republic of China in providing care to its Muslim citizens. End quote. So the Muslim world has a radically different interpretation on this situation. It sees it just like China does. So all of this is why it's truly destructive all around. We turn the Chinese population against us and we turn the Muslim world against us, even more so than they already were. One could be cynical and argue that if the US actually did succeed with these accusations at turning the world against China, this would benefit the US, the good old divide and conquer strategy. But it's exactly the opposite that's happening. It's making China more united internally and making a lot of the world, especially the Muslim world, more united with China. That clearly isn't in the interest of the American people. Back to our topic and to conclude, um, I've already spoken extensively on the freedom question, so I won't back, go back to that. So let me just speak briefly about prosperity and stability. On prosperity, the data is clear. Ch Chinese from all ethnic groups benefit. For instance, GDP per capita in Xinjiang is now 55,000 uh, yuan a year, which is 18 times higher than neighboring Afghanistan and higher than countries like Thailand or the Maldives. On stability too, no matter what you think of the Chinese government's response in Xinjiang, who could argue that it would be better for the stability of China to let separatist groups unopposed or to even agree to a partition of the country, which is what the US-backed uh, Uyghur organizations are, are asking for. Many, many, if not most countries, have issues with separatism. In France, we have Corsica and the Basque separatist movement. In the UK, they famously have Scotland now. 
would the UK be more stable if it was broken into pieces? There actually would not even be a UK anymore. Providing stability is actually preventing separatism. So to conclude, no, the maximalist claims that we make on China with regards to human rights do not mean their system is less good at providing stability, prosperity, or even freedom. It's more a reflection of our own system where we prefer to lecture other countries and go on crusades abroad than to look inwards at what we can do to make ourselves better. On this warped sense of priorities, uh, as it happens, has a real impact on our prosperity. It also results in uniting a lot of the world with China against us, which again, anyone can see is extremely damaging when it comes to our prosperity, stability, and freedom. Thank you. This is going to be, of course, a bit of a hodgepodge 10 minutes. Um, I would like to start these 10 minutes with a conceptual observation. Um, I think the previous speaker, who has delivered a remarkably spur to defense, um, has combined thousands of years of history, many different regimes in China, of course, during which all kinds of things happen in China, including China being occupied by Mongolians and other powers and um, all kinds of changes and had different, uh, different forms of, of governance. And um, also mixing in, I think, quite heavily sort of the achievements of the Chinese people. And that's sort of the point I was trying to make. I was trying to make the point that I think the Chinese people have a remarkable capacity for hard work, resilience, creativity, and perseverance. And have achieved a lot and I'm sure will continue to achieve a lot and we have a lot to learn from that. I would, I would however separate that conceptually from models of governance and models of what we are talking about here. Of course these models crucially enable the hard work of the people. Uh, governance can destroy a country. It can uh, render null the achievements of even the most hardworking. But I would make the argument here, and I would maintain this argument, um, that the liberal democratic order also facilitates the same conditions of stability and possibility of growth. But I think at much greater freedom and um, as seen, for example, in the United States, also with COVID regulations, you can have a public debate about it. You can disagree. You don't have to toe a government line. Uh, and of course, that can lead, the, the freedom of speech and, and dissenting opinion can, of course, either appear to be less stable or it can create a certain instability. But the funny thing is that this sort of instability that is created by a diversity of opinions and, and uh, voices in different political parties and so on, actually creates a resilience, a resilience of the system because people believe in the system. And this resilience, even though democracy may appear more messy, it ultimately has more resilience than authoritarian systems of governance. Now, the United States at the moment is a particular case where this resilience is to some extent at danger and so it's maybe not the best case of liberal democracy. Uh, I will also note that the, um, Mr. Bertrand had, has made many comparisons that specifically pertain to the US, looking at the worst social ills of the United States. But of course, since we are talking, and then comparing them to China, but of course we are talking about US, American, or Western liberal democracy, so we have a wide pool to choose from. So many of these social ills might be more specific to the United States, but they're not necessarily at all specific to liberal democracy, the, the Western system of governance at all. I think that's a very important point to make here. Um, so I think that um, on the whole, there's a strong argument to be made that the stability itself is not, that in fact this, this, uh, that the democratic order can be more resilient. We do need to observe, however, that this resilience in the United States is endangered because there is a loss of trust in the system. And this loss of trust in the system, of course, endangers the, ma the major pillar on which this system is built on. But that's a specific case, right? So I would, I would 
and, and if that loss continues, then the US would indeed lose the benefits of being governed by a liberal democracy at some point. Um, in terms of stability, it's quite interesting. The Economist has a very good uh, series on this. China in the 2000, early 2010s and late 2000s, right before Xi Jinping, actually had quite an interesting internal stability problem. There was a lot of corruption in the system. There was a lot of disillusionment. The cadres themselves, the officials, were really not enthralled with CCP ideology and they were getting rich. They were pursuing you know, the, the, the political party and members of the political party were primarily placed to exploit the economic growth and often at the expense of the population. And so the cadres were getting rich leading to significant problems of corruption and also loss of trust of the population. And Xi Jinping saw that and he governed a province that was affected by that. And that is probably one of the reasons why Xi Jinping then has significantly tightened the reins and has said we have to go back to the ideology. Of course, he has very strongly gone back to Marxist ideology, socialist ideology, which was always there and has reined in uh, the freedoms also of society and also in the party, partially to combat corruption, but of course he used that to purge all dissent and resistance. The question of freedom, I mean, I would have a, much could be said about the question of freedom. It's quite interesting. For me, Hong Kong is almost the, the best example. Hong Kong is a slow motion showcase of how you can turn a relatively vibrant and free region into a real police state. And I cannot go into details, of course, we see you know, the, the elimination, eradication of civil society in Hong Kong uh, since the introduction of the national security law in 2020. It's absolutely stunning and it's a case study, but of course it also reflects the lack of, of the same civil society in China. Um, it's quite interesting, in, these, in the, the period of openness in the 2000s, and 2010s, early 2010s, the investigative journalism came up in China and was investigating corrupt locals. Um, there were all kinds of phenomena, certain freedom, civil society organizations were starting to develop to some extent. That's all been crushed now um, by the Xi regime. Um, and there's no longer now there are those feedback loops. So the authoritarian resilience that Western scholars were arguing, why is the Chinese Communist Party system surviving, even though the country is getting more prosperous? Because there were certain feedback mechanisms, there were certain innovative mechanisms. Um, and these are now being eliminated though, because they also created suddenly a messy space. China became more messy and Xi Jinping moved against this messiness as, as there were sort of this, the beginnings of, of liberal democracy, not liberal, some, not liberal democracy, but um, the beginning of something, of some civil society, which were then being crushed. I have noted that problems such as weaker resistance, which was resistance, some of them were acts of terror, but being branded as terrorism, and then the preemptive internment of hundreds of thousands, if not one to two million Uyghurs and other ethnic groups in Xinjiang has been, is a, is, is a sign of a regime that does not look at problems and then learn from its own policy failures because the problems with the Uyghurs are due to Chinese policy failures. But rather, this, the regime rel, uh, on the one hand engages then in domestic repression, so systematically ruthlessly suppresses the dissent and engages in external blaming. So a lot of, that's why a lot of the Uyghurs who were put into camps, they had connections to outside, to 26 countries for, in particular, who, uh, Muslim countries, who allegedly brought um, uh, Islamic extremism on them. So you see this externalization uh, by blaming uh, Islam and uh, the other Muslim countries and then Uyghurs are actually uh, not at all particularly extremist but the state has used this argument. The, uh, there's a whole section in my first speech that I had to leave out because of time about the political paranoia. The uh, genocide scholars say that the preemptive mass, the preemptive mass internment or mass killing of a, uh, an ethnic group is a form of political paranoia whereby you uh, exaggerate your threat perception. China is now pushing a human rights definition 
that focuses away from individual human rights to collective human rights. And China says our new definition of human rights now is rather, it's not individual liberties, but it's the collective good, the economic growth. That, of course, very much suits not only its model, uh, suits or not only its economic model, but its model of governance. Because that's what the CCP has pursued. And that's an extremely concerning development. Unfortunately, it is really pushing this at the United Nations. So China is very much um, seeking to influence definition of human rights and other things at the UN, uh, and also selling its development model quite actively to other countries. Uh, just one comment on Xinjiang's GDP per capita. It's good to remember that that includes, of course, spending on domestic security and government and infrastructure and the internment camps. Thank you very much. And, 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 and thank you, Arno. Again, about 25 minutes. I would like to get to as many of these as possible and incorporate them in our conversation. So let me begin uh, with a couple of I see as factual questions. Uh, one will be directed to Arno, but then also feel free to address it to Adrian and vice versa. And then we have some more uh, spicy questions uh, 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 too. So would a debate like this be possible in China today? Uh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, well, the honest answer is, I don't know. I think uh, we often assume that there is no robust debate in, in China. Um, but that's because most of those debates are, we simply don't see, we don't speak Chinese. Uh, but when you actually look at the Chinese literature, um, we were actually speaking about that at, at lunch. Uh, well, you are telling me you were, um, you know, reading um, academic thoughts on, on China and so on, and actually surprised at, uh, at some of the views that uh, you didn't assume there was uh, such, such a wide range of, of opinion in China. And I think that's the, um, that's the impression that most people uh, have. They assume that, uh, you know, Chinese People's thoughts are extremely formatted on that you have to follow uh, an ideology and so on and so forth. Uh, but actually, uh, when you go to China, speak with people, start reading what they write, uh, that's actually not true. There, there is, uh, um, I don't think a, a country like China can be so successful without debating, without uh, waiting the pro and con of doing uh, this or that uh, is just not possible. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I think uh, it could be debated. Something like that could be debated. In public, I don't know, depending on, uh, mm -hmm. on the speakers or so, or so on, but uh, yeah, the, the uh, lack of uh, freedom to express one idea is, 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 uh, is vastly overrated. Feel free to address or pass, uh, Adrian, and we can go to the next question if you want. Uh, yes, sure. Um, I would just very briefly say that um, in, the, in the early 2000s, when I myself was in China, anything to do with foreigners was very sensitive. Certain things were possible, but was a great deal of sensitive, sensitivity, and certainly anything political was really out of the question. So a political debate between China, public political debate between Chinese and uh, Westerners that was not sort of in any way influenced or controlled was essentially unthinkable back then. And since then, um, under Xi Jinping, we see a very significant tightening of those types of spaces. And unfortunately, in my opinion, we also see one thing that I did not have the time to address was one of the strategies of the regime and I would like to also point out that a lot of my critiques of the CCP regime don't necessarily extend to the Chinese people. So if you're Chinese, you don't necessarily need to feel attacked by what I say. But what I was going to say is that, um, unfortunately, one of the techniques that Xi Jinping has used is a very virulent nationalism, which also has increased attitudes against foreigners. And I think that is also making those kinds of changes more difficult. 
of course, there's something to be said, you know, there's always some counterweight, there's something to be said about us, because we perceive China as a mounting threat, quite rightly in many ways, it, it's, uh, we need to keep in mind that we don't become virulently um, antagonistic uh, towards the Chinese population. Adrian, you used this term <clears throat> a couple of times, civil society, and uh, maybe uh, you said it doesn't suppress in China. I mean, can you give us some examples of civil society both in China and the US? What is this? So by civil society, you have a wide range of uh, organizations. Uh, they could be uh, charitable organizations, religious organizations, political organizations uh, that promote a certain cause. I mean, an entity like uh, the Abigail Adams Institute would fall under, uh, or the ISI would fall under civil society. These are uh, basically entities that would either try to promote a cause or do something active that could either complement the government or could move against the government, or it could ignore the government. Um, it, uh, civil society often fills important gaps of things unaddressed uh, by the government. Um, and uh, this is a huge term, I mean, is a, is, a, is a huge term. And I think in China, there were some elements of civil society or associations, um, and the space for that, that's the one thing, and already when I was in China, civil society was under all-out attack in, um, in the late 2000s because that's the thing, of course, that uh, provides a direct competition to the, to the Chinese Communist Party, uh, which instead relies on its own organization. So the party, as Xi Jinping has said, the party rules all. Um, the civil society posed one of the greatest threats. But this was unfortunately already before Xi Jinping. <coughs> Um, well, I think also the U.S. is quite uh, special in this regard, where mm. civil society plays an uh, enormous <coughs> role um, in the U.S. because it's, the government has a bit of a laid-off uh, attitude. So if you look, for instance, in France, my country, um, there is also quite little role for civil society uh, because uh, the government does so much, right? So, uh, the government tries to be civil society. And I think um, China uh, is definitely more similar to France than, than to the US. Uh, some what you consider civil society uh, organizations uh, are definitely there. I've, I've seen many like, I don't know, like pet rescue things, like during COVID, many <laughs> emerged uh, uh, around that. Uh, just a random example that pops to mind. Uh, my personal experience is that as soon as uh, something isn't related to politics, uh, trying to influence politics in one way or another, the government doesn't have any issue with that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave those that and then move on. Adrian, a question to you. At the end of the 19th century, almost one third of China was addicted to opium. Do we credit the regime or the people for getting clean? For getting clean? <clears throat> well, at that time, I mean, then you had, of course, the Republican government. I mean, that's, that's a question, honestly, I don't have I've not studied it. I don't have empirical evidence in my head. So I would prefer to not answer because I'm not sure that I can answer this question with a strong empirical foundation without having first looked at it further. But back at that time, of course, we are talking about, see that the, the conceptual dimension comes in again. Um, I'm very much, in my opinion, we're very much comparing the governance model of the Chinese Communist Party, which has also facilitated you know, China's economic uh, development, etc., uh, as opposed to previous iterations, such as Chiang Kai-shek or Sun Yat-sen. So I, I think that's a bit, and that governance were also worked in some ways quite differently, of course, with a similar culture. That would be my comment on that. Do you want to weigh in, Adrian? Uh, Arno? Uh, sure. So, um, yeah, just to touch upon the um, so-called opium wars, uh, that's um, uh, extremely traumatic events in, in China's history. It's the core part of uh, what they call the uh, uh, 
the 100 years of uh, humiliation uh, where basically the, the British, but also the Americans, the French, and uh, um, well, the West, I guess, um, they had a big uh, trade deficit with, with China uh, because they were buying a lot from China. And uh, in order to solve that, uh, the only thing they could sell them back was uh, opium produced in, in India. And so they went to war with China to force them uh, successfully, unfortunately, uh, to, uh, uh, to force them to get the population addicted to, uh, to opium so they could solve this, uh, this trade imbalance. Um, I'm not sure when exactly in the history of China uh, the population started to uh, get uh, you know, less addicted to opium. Uh, but it's clear that right now, uh, like I said in my, in my speech, China has one of the lowest drug abusers uh, rate in the world. And obviously, drug abuse is seen as, uh, due to their history, as a, as a huge uh, no no. I, th I think here in Boston, we have an opium row, some very nice houses from that, that period of time yeah. uh, in the mid 18. 1800. So if you're here for a couple of days, you can maybe check, 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 check those out. That's a very, very fine houses, still standing. Okay, a uh, question for you, um, Arno. Was Tiananmen Square a good thing since it ensured Chinese stability? Uh, I assume you refer to the event of uh, 1999. 89. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's always difficult in history to do hypotheticals. Uh, like, we could do the hypothetical and be like, uh, you know, had the students succeeded and, you know, had China gone the way of Russia um, around that time um, with uh, the Gorbachev style figure that they had at the time and the uh, uh, would it have gone better for China? And we have the example of Russia, <laughs> right? Uh, and it didn't go well for us. I mean, GDP uh, absolutely mm -hmm. collapsed. Uh, you know, children were had to prostitute themselves. It was a horrible time mm -hmm. for uh, for Russia. So, yeah, that's the only thing I can say, I guess. I would comment that um, the uh, suppression, the, the costly suppression of the um, riots at, uh, of, so no, not the riots, the demonstration at Tiananmen Square was justified for stability because there was, there was actually a disagreement within the party at the time and of course Tiananmen was partially provoked by factions within the party. Um, and the, the sending in the tanks and the army was justified with regime stability and saying the, for the common good and the, um, the long-term good of the country. So I think this is probably just one of many examples where the CCP and of course other authoritarian regimes would say, well, it's better that we kill a whole bunch of dissenters than that we risk the stability of the governance we have because we don't know what's gonna happen if we don't. And um, I mean, that's, an argument that somebody can make, but I would consider this argument to be extremely problematic and unfortunate. Adrian, despite particular successes and failures that, we've, that you've both talked about, could we say that China's leaders today are better at promoting the common good domestically and internationally than EU, US leaders at this moment in history? <clears throat> so, China is very successful in um, at promoting an alternative model to the developing world. It's saying, look, you know, the, the Americans and Europeans, they pursue their own self-interest, they push their own narrative. Uh, you know, we are offering an alternative model and we've been very successful economically. And that's part of the reason why I like to look specifically why and how China has been successful. Uh, which you know, has some very questionable aspects to it, in my opinion. Um, in my opinion, the Chinese alternative is a challenge for Europeans and Americans 
firstly, to actually take more note of the developing world and other countries. Um, I think we have been quite arrogant for a long time, and we have often neglected those countries and their interests, although sometimes the, their governments don't necessarily, there's, you know, some, some of the more authoritarian or problematic governments in those countries don't necessarily represent the interests of the people, but nevertheless, there are many, of course, democracies and etc. So we have been arrogant and negligent, whereas China has quite skillfully and in some ways successfully seized and, and, and paid more attention and also invested more, such as in Africa. Of course, Chinese investment in Africa has come with a lot of problems, but then again, this is a whole another debate. In my opinion, I, if I look at the whole governance model of the CCP and the way it has acted, I would simply argue that while it has prevented complete chaos and while it has delivered material uh, growth after having suppressed material growth itself in the past, the way that it treats human beings and the way that it itself comports itself uh, and the way that it also coerces its neighbors, neighboring countries and other countries such as Australia economically or Lithuania, um, I think the external coercion of the Communist Party, if you look at the brutal attacks in Northern India, if you look at the, the gray zones tactics in the South China Sea and against the Philippines and Vietnam, I very much would not uh, entrust myself to anything that comes from the CCP at all. Uh, which is not to say that they have delivered some benefits to some places where we have been more negligent in some ways. So that would be my answer. Okay. Yeah. Arno? <clears throat> so the question was on the common good? Yes, at this present moment, yeah. in, 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 at this moment in history, I'm sure the reference is to the, uh, the last 20 years or so of uh, maybe our, our foreign policy and... Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, there is an interesting survey that's released every year uh, done by uh, an organization funded by a former NATO Secretary General uh, and they asked people around the world, um, um, it's called the Democracy Perception Index, uh, so they asked people around the world uh, the question on whether they think they live in a democracy. And actually, the country, you can, you can look it up, uh, uh, that always comes up top uh, in that survey is China. It's, mm. I think the top three is China, Switzerland, and uh, ah, I can't remember the third one. And it's because they have a relatively different understanding of what democracy is. It's not about voting to them. It's about uh, having a feeling that what the government does is aligned uh, with what people want. Um, I think most Chinese people have, uh, have that impression. And it's also about uh, equality in the eyes of the law. So, um, uh, for instance, um, I think like Xi Jinping's uh, anti-corruption drive had a huge impact on that and, and made a very positive impression with the Chinese people because it showed like doesn't matter how powerful or rich you are, uh, we're gonna you know clamp, uh, we're gonna send you to prison if mm. uh, if if you've done something bad, and um, I think. Uh, this is something uh, to reflect in the West, uh, genuinely, uh, because both France and the US, for instance, less than, in that index, less than 50% actually believe they live in a democracy. Mm. And when you look, there was that study made by Princeton University in the US um, that showed that uh, government policies, there is almost zero correlation uh, with what people want. Um, I think these drivers, the, the Chinese understanding of democracy, those two things, uh, is probably something that uh, we should reflect uh, quite deeply on in, in our own democracies uh, because it's, uh, it actually matters. It's not only about voting. Thank you. Uh, whoever asked this question, please see me after the debate. It's, uh it's very funny and it raises a very big, uh, big topic that we haven't really covered, but it's, a, it's very punchy. Monsieur, if I may be so bold, what is your social credit score? 
Oh, that's an excellent so, question. Yeah. Uh, uh, I love that one. Yes. I love that one because it will enable me to debunk a very common myth. Uh, there is no social credit score in China. It doesn't exist. You go to any Chinese person, what's your social credit score? They will look at you like with, uh, with weird eyes. It's a myth that it's a story that we tell ourselves, like so many things about China. It mm. does not exist. Uh, there are no social credit scores. Yeah. The only thing that does exist is a system of blacklists um, yeah. where, uh, yeah, so it's quite different uh, that um, you can be convicted um, in, in, a, in a court of law if you've yeah. committed fraud. So it happens, to, I know two people who are on, on a blacklist because they actually defrauded me. <laughs> so I'm quite familiar with the situation. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, they basically uh, went around and borrowed money from uh, a bunch of people with white promises uh, that turned out to be completely fake. They were just uh, fraudsters. And so they got sued in a court of law. And then uh, we're not gonna send you know, all the fraudsters to prison. Uh, so one type of conviction uh, of, uh, of penalty, I guess, is, is you're put on a blacklist uh, that forbids you to take a uh, fast train or the plane mm. or put your kids in private school, all sorts of uh, luxuries, um, until you reimburse those you've, uh, you've defrauded um, okay. or you know, right your wrong. So that's what exists, but no one in China has a score that varies based on yeah. your action in everyday life. That, yeah. That's not true. What's your FICO score, I guess, is the, in America, right? For, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a yeah. softer version of the question. Do you want to weigh in on this? Uh, uh, social credit is a complex topic because there were several very pertinent experiments uh, on it, which is by the uh, way, it's a feature of CCP governance. It's uh, one of the more interesting ones. There were several experimental policies uh, on that uh, in different cities. And the efforts to reconcile that or to combine that into a national policy, I think, is still uh, ongoing at some point. But I'm not up to date on the latest. Yeah. Okay, I think maybe one, one more question. And this one, so there are several, many were, were triggered by your focus, um, Arno, on the four freedoms and your neglect of political freedom. So mm -hmm. uh, in your opening uh, defense of uh, argument in, in four freedom in the Chinese case, the West has had many different political systems not all of them democratic, but surely we must resist and um, we must resist uh, all challenges uh, um, to the system, to the systems that are despotic and servile and threaten the possibility of human freedom and self rule. Um, so you don't talk enough about political freedom as the best ally of sanity, humanity, and ultimately the peaks of human life. How can we treat as a moral equal regime given to cruelty, insanity, fanaticism, despotism on a vast <coughs> scale? I'm not sure I understand the question. Poli uh, you, you neglected political freedom in okay, your- Okay, so in your, political in your, freedom. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, sorry. To... <laughs> um, yeah, I mean- Is it important? Yeah. Uh, Does it matter anymore? I mean, China sees itself in a, in a very, very different way uh, in that regard. Um, I think what the Chinese will say is that they have uh, what's called, what they call the whole process democracy or consultative democracy, as opposed to uh, elective uh, electoral de democracy, democracy, where, where um, they don't think that electing people based on uh, you know, how they present themselves to voters, who is the best at, uh, at uh, getting elected, is the right way of choosing, uh, uh, choosing leaders. Uh, they think, I'm not saying I especially uh, mm -hmm. agree or not with that, I'm just saying the way they, uh, they explain it. Um, they believe that uh, in order to become a leader of, um, um, I don't know, province or the whole country, you need to uh, make your proof first. So you need to go to, uh, uh, you need to you know, be the best at school and then the best at managing a village and then the best at managing a town <coughs> and then uh, a city and then you manage a province and so on and so on. It's, it's the whole uh, mm -hmm. 
meritocracy thing and um, and throughout the country they have all these mechanisms of feedback uh, to understand what the Chinese people want. Now it's true that they have many mechanisms of, uh, of feedback like uh, for instance there is this uh, hotline uh, that you can use all around China called the 12345 where any issue that you have with the government or that the government can solve uh, you, you call that hotline mm -hmm. and they're uh, obligated to, uh, to answer it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a ticketing system, only you as a customer can close the ticket and uh, basically you don't close the ticket until they've, uh, they've answered it. So that's one feedback system. Okay. Also they often ask for, for feedback and so on. So just to show that uh, it's, not, uh, yeah. it's not that easy to show like there is no election, so it's bad. It's, it's, it's such a different way of, uh, of seeing things. Yeah. The comparative worth of political freedom, Adrian, if you wanna. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I've, there were was, there was some um, comments on democracy before. And in my opinion, in my personal opinion, I would like to just state very clearly that in my view, there is really no ground whatsoever to call anything in China democracy. I think there is no more ability of the common people to determine political process. I think under Xi Jinping, there is no democracy in China. It's, I think it's not legitimate to use that term. It's my personal opinion. I think with political freedom, we have a very essential dimension of freedom because it's a foundation for so many other things. Political freedom makes we get to determine an element of our governance, of those who govern us and how we're being governed. Um, that creates an incredible amount of, or has the potential to create an incredible accountability that we get to vote for also on behalf of a certain policy in a, in a certain political system. And so I think in China, I think the interest and the hunger for political freedom is actually probably quite more substantial than we think. And we saw a glimpse of that during the anti-zero COVID lockdown protests in October, November last year. And the protesters then also, to some extent, combined their demands with uh, Xi Jinping to step down. And um, I think that's really not something to be underestimated. But the system is so heavily suppressed that for the most of the time, we would no have, have no opinion what the, the interest of the Chinese people is about political freedom. But I think that's a very dangerous thing, just because China is a different country and different culture, etc. I think there's a, there's a great deal that is about a lot of people, of course, if we live then have, can have conversations, but still, there's a lot that we don't really know <coughs> about public opinion. And political freedom is really essential. But I would also agree with Arno that other forms of freedom are also important. So we have different forms of freedom that combine to liberty. Well, first, thank you, audience, for the uh, questions. We're, and there are many more that are very good. Maybe we'll get to them later in informal conversations. They will stick around for 10 or 15 minutes if you have uh, questions to ask them. But I also want to thank you both for those well-crafted, thoughtful uh, presentations. Uh, you obviously tried to maximize, uh, best use your time uh, in the best possible way. So thank you for, more, most importantly, free and insightful debate, but also for it being a civil debate. Uh, thank you to our debaters. Uh, before everyone goes, um, sorry about that. no, it's fine. Uh, thank you everyone for attending this debate and uh, listening. And I thought it was quite edifying and informative and engaging. So I appreciate it a lot. To all of our listeners who are listening at home or viewing at home, as well as everyone here, uh, for those at home, there's a QR code that should be coming up on screen uh, in the, the bottom right corner. And everyone on their seat had a QR code. Uh, so now you can take out your phone and we get to vote uh, on who you think won the debate and also what your thoughts were on the debate. Uh, this feedback is very helpful. So you can take the QR code with you if you have to leave now. But if everyone could fill that out, we'd be great, very grateful. Uh, for your feedback and so then we can announce a winner so but aside from that thank you again for coming and have a great night thank you. Thank you.